seems appropriate uh, with this presentation that we offer a word of prayer. So please bow your heads. Our Father, we appreciate all you have given us. In particular, on this Sunday, we pause to remember those who have given generously to enhance the beauty of our sanctuary by providing these beautiful stained glass windows. Help us to honor both the donors and those honored by the windows and to better grasp the significance of their meaning. We remember too our beloved former pastor, Walter Rock, who first brought the meaning of the windows to our attention. In Jesus' name, amen. Following the presentation, I do have a handout, a one-page summary of everything I'm going to tell you. But in addition to that, there are three pages that contain uh, Wally Watkins' entire sermon that he gave. So uh, you want to come back some kind of sanctuary, sit with that, and just look at the windows as you read it through yourselves. But it's very helpful. Uh, you can also read an edited version of uh, Wally's sermon on our church website. It's under a heading, Sanctuary Tour. It's edited from his original. So this historic stone church was completed and dedicated in this very month on May 1897, 120 years ago this year. Uh, Joan is going to pass around a photo taken at some early date of this church. And notice in the photo you will see what looked like stained glass windows and also the uh, carriage house and a horse hitching trail that we had back in those days. I think that's pretty close to the time the church was built. Now, Reverend Wally Wadman, Wallace Wadman, served as parish associate at Poland Presbyterian Church from 1977 to 1986. He was very much loved by the members of the congregation. Our church still has the Wally Wadman Memorial Scholarship in his name. Wally died in 1988, and he and his wife Mary are buried in Riverside Cemetery. The inscription on his marker reads, God is our refuge and strength. Following Mary's passing in 1979, Wally, in 1983, married Edith, whom he had met on a tour of the Holy Land. They enjoyed travel and ministry together before his death, and Edith died in 2012. She was the mother of Anne Hutchison. One of Wally's most memorable sermons was presented on June the 22nd, 1986. Its topic explored the symbolism and meaning of the various stained glass windows in our sanctuary. The following account of our windows is in part based on that memorable sermon, along with some information about those for whom the windows were dedicated. So let's look briefly at some of the symbols in the front windows up here. Wally surmised that the, uh, well, my flash is not going to work too well because it's not so bright, which is here. He surmised that the 12 flowers in the middle might represent the 12 disciples. There are also 12 discs, right here? Yeah. Well, more. Okay, anyhow, the 12 disciples possibly. 10 might represent the 10 commandments, I think, there, if you go across there. Uh, there are eight that he said might represent the eight days of pure in the, uh, the Jewish holiday. First window we want to look at is the one behind you that you can't see very well. At the bottom it says, presented by Isaac, Edna, and Bella Walker. Uh, while they said that the window behind the lectern shows an anchor, the writer to the Hebrew says, this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Now when I first started research on this, I thought the Walkers donated only this window. I have come to believe, and after reading Wally's sermon, they presented all of the windows in front of the church here. I think. So we learned a lot about the Walker family from my friend Ken Heinemann, Ken Heinemann in his Riverside Cemetery Journal. Isaac is the son of Josiah and Nancy Walker, who are buried in the old graveyard over here. At one time, that family owned over 700 acres of land between Western Reserve Road and what we call Walker Mill Road. By raising sheep and sawing a lot of lumber, they became quite well to do. Isaac lived on that family farm out near Walker Mill Road until 1886 when he retired because of a broken leg. He then moved to Poland Village and purchased the large frame house next door to the Presbyterian Church here, what we call the Powers House. 
that was originally built by Turk and Kirk. It is said that the barn that now sits behind the house was built with the heavy timbers from Walker's abandoned sawmill out on Walker Mill Road. Isaac made other improvements to the house too, including the fine stone sidewalk and the wrought iron fence in the front of it. In 1860, Isaac Walker married Rebecca Edna Stewart, and they had one daughter, Della. Della became a physician and practiced in Salem, Ohio. On October the 10th, 1900, Isaac died at his home from what his obituary called infirmities of old age. He was 81. His family monument in Riverside Cemetery is quite impressive. It's right near the uh, speaker's roster, uh, being among the tallest monuments in the cemetery. On the monument, we read that his wife Edna died in 1918, and Della, the daughter, physician, lived until 1944. There were no descendants that I'm aware of because Della never married. In the center, we have the McMaster window, I call it. It says at the bottom, in memory of Reverend Algernon S. McMaster. So this could perhaps be one sentence. Presented by Isaac Edna and Della Walker, in memory of Reverend Algernon S. McMaster. Or perhaps the whole congregation donated it. The center window bears the inscription, as I read, in memory of Reverend Algernon and Master, D.D., so he was a doctor of divinity. Walbe told us that the white lilies in the center also refer to Christ's resurrection. Now, Dr. McMaster served as pastor at this church from 1854 to 1878, a total of 24 years, which was the longest pastor up to that time, and I believe it still is, or at least it's tied. It's an indication that he and the congregation had sort of a mutual admiration society. He and his family lived in the large home at 21 Riverside Drive. So if you go down 170, take a right on Riverside, over to the left, there's a large white house, has a stairway coming down off the house. That's the house they lived in. Uh, the window was dedicated probably when the church was built in 1897, uh, and Dr. McMaster had already died in 1882, 15 years earlier, but apparently the congregation living at that time felt so much of him that they dedicated the windows for him. Now, a month after Reverend McMaster was installed at this church in 1854, the church officers appointed a committee to investigate the building of a new church to replace the frame building that was on the village green, on the green. The red brick church, which became in this location, was the result of what they came up with. The old schoolhouse that had been on these grounds had to be moved to make room for the Red Brick Church. The Civil War was fought during the time that Reverend McMaster was a pastor, and on one Sunday in July of 1863, several men in the church left the worship service in a break to answer the alarm that John Morgan's raiders were in the area down in Columbia County. For a time, Reverend McMaster was also asked to serve as principal of the academy in Poland. And his daughter, Mary McMaster Maxwell, was one of the teachers. On April 28, 1878, the session of this church adopted the following resolution. Resolved that it is with feelings of devout thankfulness that we contemplate the great and good work the Master has accomplished through him in our midst. During a period of 24 years, we delighted to honor him as an influential presbyter, an able theologian, a faithful preacher, a Christian gentleman, a sympathetic friend, and of commendary influence in the community. McMaster retired from this church in 1878, and when his death began, or his uh, health began to fail, he moved to Newtonia to live with his daughter Mary and her husband, Reverend Alex Maxwell. Uh, McMaster died at the age of 75 in 1882. There is a large family monument in Riverside Cemetery honoring the Masters, and you will see a picture of him back in the narthex on the wall with all the other ministers. Over to the right at the bottom, the window nearest the pulpit, it's marked Window Restoration 1998 by Gertrude Geiger Struble. Wally explained that the window contains a sheaf of wheat. In Psalm 126 we read, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And Luke writes, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. 
Many of you may remember Gertrude if you've been here for a while. She was the daughter of Gottlieb and Marie Haas Geiger, who were born in Germany. And Gertrude was born in 1907 in this country. Her husband was Arthur Strubel, who was a chiropractor, but he died long before Gertrude in 1970. At various times, the Strubels lived in Wolville at 319 South Main Street, and the house is no longer there, and on, uh, on Koblenz Drive. Now, Gertrude was a prenatal nurse for her occupation, and Ted, thankfully, gave me a newspaper picture from 1954 showing some young expected couple, couples how to care for newborn, being instructed by Gertrude Stupel. Among those being instructed are Mr. and Mrs. Norm Wittenauer, Mrs. Sue Wright, and Ted and Kitty Hyman. Joan's going to pass that picture around so you have to look at it. Ted has volunteered to serve in the nursery any time we need people to change diapers. So. In 1998, Gertrude made a large donation of $50,000 to our church to support the maintenance, repair, and improvement of the Stone Church building. Some of that donation was then used to restore these beautiful windows. She died in 2005 at the age of 97, and the Strubles are buried in the Wolfen Cemetery. Now I'm going to shift your attention over to the sidewalk. First window, the Moses window, was produced by the Bhatti student, B-O-T-T-I, of Evanston, Illinois. It says at the bottom, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. That's from Hebrews 10, 16. Then it also says, in memory of Mr. and Mrs. J. L. Monty, 1890-1967. Reverend Wadman said, this window shows the great Hebrew leader and lawgiver in all his qualities of seriousness, firmness, and purpose. We need especially to examine the tablet of the law of God. Here they are very small, showing only the first words of each commandment. Now Pete and all of Monty were the parents of Bunky Stone. She and John donated this window to the Holy Presbyterian Church, we think, in 1982. Uh, the Monty's lived at 18 Poland Manor. Now Pete was born in Turkey City, Pennsylvania. This is something I learned about my research that completely blew my mind. He was a star football player and captain of the Penn State University football team, starting at fullback and kicking field goals for four years from 1909 to 1912. During his time there, Penn State lost only two games in four years. The 1912 team is known for playing the first of a series of games against their rival, eventual rival, Ohio State. B. Ohio State University. That game in 1912, Penn State won the game by 37 to 0. The Buckeyes forfeited the game because of the brutal play of Penn State's Nicky Lions. Sorry to say that. Uh, Pete was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1957. And I have a picture of the team with Pete sitting in the middle as captain that will be passed around. So after an illustrious football career, Pete Moffey worked in the steel industry for 50 years, retiring in 1963. He served for six years as president of Youngstown Chief and Two. He served on the board of trustees at both Youngstown State University and Penn State University. He was chairman of the Poland Municipal Forest Board and donated the materials for the 125-foot walking bridge built in Poland Woods in 1956. That bridge is named in his honor as well as the Moffey Park and Struthers. Pete died in his sleep on New Year's Day, 1967. His wife, Olive, was born in McKeesport, Pennsylvania in 1893. In 1952, she had the honor of christening the Interlake Steamship War Vessel named the J.L. Moffey. Olive was active in community affairs and died only five days after her husband in 1967 apparently the result of a heart attack she experienced upon finding him dead. The Moffies are buried in a large mausoleum near the Riverside Cemetery Chapel. Now if we turn to the back rear window, Tiffany window, the inscription says, in memory of John Errol, Poland pioneer, a founder and charter member of this church and of his family. While they said about the window, the window's portrayal of the Good Shepherd varies from the usual 
As here, the artist chose not to place lambs in the shepherd's arms. The sheep watch him as he leads, assures and blesses them. His figure is shown in ivory white opalescent glass, surrounded by rich verdant pasture, trees, and brook. His staff provides added assurance of safety. While he shows the way, it is our responsibility to respond and follow as members of his flock. Louis Tiffany, developer of the famous Favre class, brought the large painted picture measure to its highest point. Favreau means that the color is ingrained in the glass itself, which was a Tiffany creation. This window has a protective glass both inside and out. A small plaque beneath the window says, Exterior plexiglass window is donated in memory of Isabel Vance, who died in 1989. People ask about its value. No price can be given, and is, as it is truly irreplaceable. Now, John and Margaret Arrow came to this area in 1801. They settled by a spring in the center of a 202-acre farm bought by John's father, David Arrow. John was only 28, and Margaret was 26 at that time. The piece of forest was located on what is now the Arrow Road property, bound on the south by the south line of the Connecticut Western Reserve. John was a founding member and elder of this church clear back in 1802 at its beginning. Errol Road is named for him and his family. He died in 1848, and he and his family are buried in row one of the graveyard adjoining the church. <coughs> the window itself, however, was installed in 1914, 103 years ago, and was presented to the church by John's grandson, Judge George F. Errol. Judge Errol was a friend and actually a roommate of William McKinley at the Albany Law School. And his wife was Grace Todd, who was the daughter of Ohio Governor David Todd from Youngstown. Now you can't see it from here, but out in the entrance way is the Arnold window. It's in that direction. It says at the bottom, in memory of Janet Moore Arnott, 1920 to 1984, a lifelong member of this church. And from St. Matthew 28, 19-20, it reads, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. While they commented about that window, you should notice that unlike most other windows, there is no border. It has a canvas-like painting in rich, somber colors and shades, extending from edge to edge. The central motif shows a large circular band in gold, enclosing a ruby cross above a Bible and part of the earth, North and South America. The circle is a symbol of eternity in the world and reminds us that the cross of Christ is for the world. Janet Moore Arnott was the daughter of William and Sarah Moore and came to Poland as an infant. She and her husband Charles Chuck were longtime active members of this congregation. Charles had been an FBI agent at one time, and he died in 1996. Janet was a 1938 graduate of Poland Seminary High School, and later Ohio Wesleyan University. She worked as a librarian at the Youngstown State University. Her church service involved chairing the scholarship committee, presiding over the Women's Association, and she was also involved in community groups such as the Poland Women's Club, Poland Village Club, Trailwood Gardeners, the Poland Swim Club. She died at the age of 63 in 1984 and is buried along with Chuck in Riverside Cemetery. Now also in the entrance way, last year a new stained glass window was installed above the entrance door to the narthex. It was sponsored by an anonymous donor, so I can't tell you much about it. Now, coming back up to the front, the rose window over the chancel. Rose <coughs> simply means circular. So uh, Wally said about this, when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, the Gospels tell us that the Spirit of God descended and rested upon him like a dove. Doves are also, of course, the emblem of peace. Now, if you strain the next book way up high behind the choir up there, you'll see another rose window over the back. That shows the cross and crown, indicative of the crucifixion theme. 
It was at the back of the original church. Uh, that's where the church ended on that wall. So if you go back in the parking lot, you can't see that window because of the roof line of the education building. You can see it right in there. Now, we're not sure, but Ted tells me, I always trust what Ted, Ted says, that the speculation that these windows are in the chapel may have been from the original church that stood here at one time, and they salvaged them and put them in the, the chapel. We have a ledger out of the Little Red Schoolhouse, a work ledger, that shows that John Nesman was one of the contractors, one of the main contractors for building this stone church. John Nesman lived across the street, the second house down from Nesman. Ted helped me do a little research. Uh, we were trying to put a date with that Moses window. So Ted called George Manhattan, and George was very helpful. He remembered, first of all, there's a picture of it in the 1984 directory, picture directory of the church, so we know it was done before 1984. But George remembered that uh, the first wedding to occur after that window was installed was uh, Paula Ringer and Jeff Bernstein. So I was able to find in the records that that took place in July of 18, or I'm sorry, 1982. And there was no other wedding before that until uh, June. And uh, George told Ted that he remembered that because, of course, the Bernstein family had some folks who were to Jewish religion, and they appreciated seeing Moses in our church here, which would make sense. So now as you gaze at these uh, beautiful windows in the future, I hope you will have before and richer understanding of their meaning, and also a deeper appreciation for those who donated them and the person to whom they were dedicated. I do hope, however, that you will not let your gazing at the windows detract from your attention to the minister's words. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do have an example.